Still British Columbia. I don't know how many of you have ever been to British Columbia. Well, we're right down by the U.S.-Canada border. You can't go further south in B.C. without going through the Osuyus Indian Reserve. We're right in the middle of the province, about four and a half hours, five hours from, from the coast. We're just over 500 people. We're not a very big reserve. Land-wise, we've got 32,000 acres, 32,000 acres, which is big for the province of British Columbia. It's small for the reserves in the prairies. But I want to thank the mayor and the council members and the, the leadership, the Métis leadership here for, for inviting me here and giving me a chance to share my experience, share a few stories. And as Vince said, the way I talk is the way the old people talked to me when I was growing up. The way I'll speak here tonight is the way I, is the way I speak back home. Some people might not like it, but I always say, well, that's okay. Because when, once you're a leader, you can't please everybody. In fact, that's the worst thing you can try and do is please everybody. And what I've learned over the years in order to, to be successful, you have to concentrate on two things I like doing. I'm probably the only chief that goes around and says this. The main, two, the main two things I like doing, first thing I like doing is creating jobs. Because I expect every one of my people, especially the youth, I expect every one of my people to be in a job. Especially now that summer's coming up. When my high school kids are out of high school, they had better be in a summer job. Because I want my people, when they're young, to experience hard work. It's only through hard work, not being lazy. And back home, the old timers have a term for people that are lazy. They call them the lazy ones. They always say, stay away from the lazy crowd. Stay away from the lazy ones. Because people that are lazy are never gonna go anywhere. They'll never have nice things and they'll never accomplish anything and they'll never help out their people because they're lazy. As native people, we all come from a working culture. And the hardest working people I've ever seen on my travels, and I've, Pinehurst is gonna be, Pine House, excuse me. Pine House is gonna be added to that list and I'm glad Vince, was, we were able to stop and get a picture with your sign here because I'm going to show that at our conference at the end of June that we're having it. Two times a year we gather in Osuyus, and I hope some of your leadership can come to Osuyus and maybe bring some youth. I love it when leadership brings youth with them because as Native people, we're a visual people. That's what I firmly believe. We have to see it in order to get it. If you come to Osuyus, you're going to see Native people working in all of our operations. We hire Native people from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, all over BC and the Yukon. We employ more Native people at Osuyus than any other reserve in this country does. We have more band-owned businesses on a per capita basis than any other First Nation in this country. Because that's what I love doing. I love creating jobs. In fact, when I get back to the airport here, I'm going to be on my phone talking to one of our white consultants about how many Native people are going to be working on that project. Because I want my people working. Even if it's a one-week job, it's still important because that person's working for one week. And it's, it's very important, especially for young people, to add to your resume. Your resume is the first thing the boss wants to see, an employer wants to see, is your resume. What's on your resume? Do you play sports? Put it on there. Do you volunteer? Put it on there. Do you participate in cultural activities? Put it on there. Are you a good student? That's what bosses look for. And the harder you work, 
the more money you're going to make. That's how life works. Because the second thing I love doing after I love creating jobs is I love making money for my people. I love making money for the Osuyu's First Nation. Because the other thing our people have to understand, we need financial strength. If you don't have financial strength, you can't be independent. Without financial strength, you're going to be dependent on white people, on white governments. And I don't want my people back home being dependent on white governments or going around like this with their hand out to shamas. We, in our language, that's word for white people. I tell my people, I don't want any of my people sitting on their butt going like this. That is not what a proud native person does or a proud Métis person does. I had a chance, Vince drove me around your village area here. Because one thing I always want to do when I go to another place, another native village area, is I want to see your housing. I want to see your community buildings. I'm not looking for fancy. That's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is do those native people look after what they got? Do those native people appreciate what they have, even if you don't have much. And what I've always noticed, it's always the older people that have the nicest yards, the nicest looking houses. Because they, they, they have native pride of ownership. That's what I'm looking for. Does your community have native pride of ownership? The other thing I've learned about being in business, or being a good worker, is that first impressions are very important. You only get one chance to make a first impression to your boss or to strangers or whoever it may be. My first impression of your village site here, you guys are on my good list, is I was traveling with Vince. As I was traveling around, I said, this, the, the yards are so clean. I don't see garbage lying everywhere. I don't see broken down stuff, all of this stuff that sometimes I see amongst our peoples. So it made me very proud because when, when I go somewhere and I see garbage lying around or I see native people not looking after what they got, it makes me upset as a native person. Because as Native people, we are not what the, a lot of white people say. We're not lazy. We're not dirty. We're not slummy. I believe Métis people, Native people, First Nations people, we are a proud people and we have to project that every chance we get. I don't ever want to see my people walking around with their heads down. When you walk around in a city or a town, you keep your head up. Don't be ashamed of being Métis or First Nation. You look those white people in the eye because this is your territory. Bottom line, this is your territory. Now I want to thank the leadership here. I don't know much about your guys' business, but what I do know is you're engaging in the mining in the, the mining companies around here, which you have to do, whether you like it or not. It's kind of like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But as I mentioned, the second thing I love doing is making money. I don't have a love of money. This is the equation that's stamped in my mind. The equation that's in my mind is money equals opportunity. That's what money is to me. I don't have a love of money. I have a love of opportunity. I want my young people to grow up with nice things. I want them to have opportunity. I want, to ha want them to have good jobs. I want to, ha to see them growing up in nice things. Your school here looks awesome from the drive-by that I did. 
you got one of the best native schools I've ever seen in my travels. That is so awesome. And to the high school teacher that I just met, I mentioned to him, I'm going to leave some videos with your high school here. Videos done on Yasuyu Singing Band, videos done on me, where I'm speaking, and I'm showing walking the talk. We got to start walking our talk. There isn't enough of that. There's a lot of talk going on. We need to start walking our talk. And we, need, we also need to start putting our money where our mouth is. Because the reality is, in today's society, you have to have financial strength. We need finance people. You can't run a business without finance people. If somebody is not keeping it in charge of the purse strings, before you know it, you're bankrupt. Before you know it, you don't have enough money for all the plans that you have up on the wall. And without money, words don't have any legs. I had a chance to see some of your fishing boats down here. I tell native people, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We got to get this concept of a free lunch out of our mind. Because there is no such thing as a free lunch. Even if you happen to get a free lunch, somebody behind the scenes paid for that lunch. Somebody behind the scenes paid for it. Even if it's all traditional food that sits on the table, it costs money to put that food there. Because where I come from, bullets aren't free, gas isn't free, fishing boats aren't free, nets aren't free. There is no such thing as a free lunch. And too many native people have this concept of, I want a free lunch. There is no such thing as a free lunch. It gets back to the concept, the old time work ethic. All of our communities worked hard way back when. We never depended on anybody for our food, clothing, and shelter. We worked for it. Went to bed early and got up early. So we need financial strength. And you have to have people on council that are gonna protect and even argue against their own people, which I have to do back home too. I argue against my own people. Because some of my people just want to spend, spend, spend. You can't do that. If all you do is spend, 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 pretty soon, that golden egg is going to be gone. That nest egg. You have to have a savings account. There's always going to be rough times. Always is. And I'm so glad that many of the old timers back home, where I come from, they, they go like this when it comes, when we start overspending or getting near our budget, especially the finance people. I love bookkeepers, because they go like this to you, because they're watching the money. In a community, you have to have somebody watching that money, protecting that money, and making sure all the money is just not whittled away. That's why you have to invest. If you guys did an agreement, you guys got to save a good majority of that because sometimes you only get one chance at doing it right. You get one chance at it. You don't get another chance. I've seen native people blow land claim settlements. I've seen native people blow settlements that they get for mining companies. Two or three years down the roads, they're back, they're back in the same condition they were before. So there has to be leadership that are going to make sure that the financial strength that you have an opportunity for now grows and maintains itself. A past national chief from Manitoba, he was Cree as well. Ovid Mercury said this, I'll always remember this, what he said. It's the economic horse that pulls the social cart. 
It's the economic horse that pulls the social cart. Too many of our people are trying to put the cart before the horse. You can't deal with all these social problems. You know, all these social problems cost money too. Health problems cost money. Education costs money. Recreation costs money. Elders programs cost money. Youth programs cost money. Everything costs money. You can't put the social cart before the horse. That's not how it works. But over and over I hear Native people always talking about we've got to deal with our social problems. Well, dealing with social problems costs money too. Where's that money going to come from? You've got to have money. Your First Nation or your Métis community must have money. Your own source revenue, not money that comes from somewhere else. These funded programs, these grant programs. You have to have financial strength. Because everything back home, all of our ceremonies back home cost money. And I'm sure the same is here. Everything here costs money. To have this elders gathering costs thousands and thousands of dollars. Every time your community wants to do something, it's going to cost money. You can put up on a list all of what your community needs are, but if you don't have dollar signs behind, beside every one of those needs, you're never going to be able to look after them. The writing's on the wall when it comes to Native people, when it comes to these cutbacks. Every year our people face health, health cutbacks. But because of Suyus, we make our own money, our people don't experience health cutbacks. Our business profits and our lease revenues, our own self-generated income, we cover all of those cutbacks where the government says, you Native people, you're not going to get this anymore, you're not going to get that prescription anymore, you're not going to be eligible for this. Because I focus on making money, we cover all those things on our own. And you can't say you support education. Everybody always puts up their hands and says, I believe in education, I support education. I want our youth to be educated. I want our youth to graduate. I want our youth to go off to college, university. I want our youth to get involved in trades. Well, you can't say you support education if you don't put up your other hand and say you support economic, you don't, that you support business development. Because to me, every educated person I've ever seen wants a job. People don't get educated so they can live on welfare. They don't. Everybody says the youth are our future leaders. I'm sure they say that here. Our youth are our future leaders. Well, if you truly believe that, you'd better start creating jobs. Because the reality is, on the First Nations, Numbers don't lie. Over 50% on most First Nations, people have left the reserve. They're leaving. Over 50% already have left. And that's because there's no jobs. Educated people will not hang around where there are no jobs, decent paying jobs. So that's why a chief way down in the south told me many years ago, if you don't focus on creating jobs in business, your young people, especially those you call your future leaders, they're going to scatter. They're going to leave the community and scatter throughout. And most of them ain't going to come back. At Osuyu's, people are coming back because we have the jobs. We have more jobs than we do band members. And as I mentioned, we employ Native people from all over Western Canada. So I have a job focus. At our council table, we talk about jobs all the time. But we also talk about money. We also have our finance people right beside us telling us that we have to protect our cash flow. We have to protect our bank account. Because if we don't, then we're not going in the right direction. 
You're either becoming independent or you're staying dependent. One of the two. I hope you're taking the independent route. I hope your community is focused on being independent and not dependent. Because as native people, we have to get away from this notion that the, we got to get rid of this welfare mentality. A chief that passed away many years ago told me this. He said, the worst thing, the very worst thing white people ever brought to us was welfare. It used to be shameful to be on welfare. It used to be. We have to get back to that, where it used to be shameful to be on welfare. I can't stand welfare. I've never accepted a welfare check, and so many of my people across the country I've heard, especially the old people. Now it's fine if you're a single mother or, or handicapped, or if, you, if you're old enough to have earned your rest, you're retired. But able-bodied people should be working. They should be in a job, and to me, the biggest social problems we have are because of the unemployment rates. The biggest problem of all of these social ills that we have is because of this word. The idleness of unemployment. That's the other quote that sticks in my mind all the time. Is our biggest problems we have are because of the idleness of unemployment. What I've noticed is hardworking people are healthier. Hardworking people are less dependent. Hardworking people is what you want here. So I'm very proud to have been here today. I get to do this about three times a month where I go around Aboriginal country and talk about the path to independence, the path to being self-supporting, the path to where Native pride really comes from, is from a working culture. Cree and Métis people come from a working culture, plain and simple. Cree and Métis people are hard-working people, traditionally. That's what I want to see for all Cree and Métis people and all Native people in this country. That we live, that we go back to the working lifestyle that we all had at one time. And we get rid of this idleness of unemployment. We get rid of the biggest budget that exists on most reserves, that's the welfare budget. We get, we get rid of that. Is leaders, well, whoever your leaders are here. And the leaders are not just the mayor and council, as I tell First Nations people. The leaders are not just the elected reps. The leaders are anybody in that community who is collecting a paycheck on behalf of that village. The teachers that work here hold a leadership position. The people that work in your admin offices hold a leadership position. The people that work in your daycare, we happen to pass some, some daycare teachers walking your little kids down the road. Those two ladies I saw this morning, they are leaders here. So the leaders are not just the mayor and council. And all the burden just can't be put on the mayor and council. Everybody has to accept their responsibility for the conditions that exist here. The good and the bad. Back home, I tell my people, we are all responsible for the present condition of this Suyus Indian band. So I would really hope that the leaders here, and even the older people, you have to have that older voice around all of our leadership tables. The elders, 
And it's good to see that you're having an elders conference here. That is awesome. That is so awesome to see. One of my elders back home who passed away last year, an elderly lady, this is, what, this is the bed, one of the best lessons I can leave with you. And I'm sure the old timers here have said it as well. One of the best things you can learn that will take you a long ways in your life, and we all can do this. She said, be a good listener. Be a good listener. I know some of you will listen to what I have to say and some of you won't. That's just the way human beings are. But those that listen will always go the furthest. Those that listen the best, they're going to be the ones that will help out their people the most. When you have a boss, listen to your boss. Those that listen to their boss, get moved up the ladder faster. Those that listen to their boss get the better raises, get the better bonuses. Those that listen to their boss will make more money. That's how it works in business. And in sports, those that listen to their coaches are always the best athletes. Whether you're a hockey player, ball player, golfer, whatever it may be, basketball, those that listen to their coaches are always the star players. You got to be a good listener. And some of the most important people to listen to are the elders. Because they have the experience that you don't have. I have experience. 25 years as being a chief. Traveled all over Canada, the States, New Zealand. Australia. When I go overseas to Australia, the Aborigines want to know, how do we create jobs and make money? How do we get out of this dependency, this welfare cycle? How? In the stories I hear in Australia, in New Zealand, those native people down there are going through the same challenges and have the same issues that we have up here. It was amazing for me to finally see that, that no matter where we are in Aboriginal country, we're going through the same challenges and the same issues. They have land claim issues down there. They have treaty issues down there. They're dealing with mining companies down there on how to get, make sure those mining companies respect the land and have environmental standards, but also how they get involved in the mining industry with jobs for their people and royalty payments back. So as native people, we're the same in a lot of ways. But be a good listener throughout your life. I'm, I'm still a student. I don't consider myself a know-it-all. One of the best words I ever heard from one of my teachers was Jim Rohn. He said, always be a student. Always. And today, in today's world, Leaders are readers. You got to be able to read. So to the youth, start reading at a, at a young age. Have a love of reading. I have a love of reading. If you ever come to my house, you're going to see one of the biggest native book collections and the biggest libraries in somebody's house. I'm always buying books. I'm always reading. I'm always listening. I always buy these, these CDs, books. So when I'm traveling in my vehicle for hours, like I know the mayor does, council does, Vince does, all, all your leaders in this community, you, got, you guys have to travel those roads for hours and hours. You spend a lot of time on the road. Turn your vehicle into a learning vehicle. When you travel with me, uh, I like my music, but half the time I'm listening to books while I'm traveling. I'm listening to tapes over and over again. I'm listening to the old speeches I've collected throughout my 25 years. I'm listening to Martin Luther King. I got a four disc on Martin Luther King speeches. So I'm always learning. The best leaders and the best athletes are always training. They're always learning. So be a reader. 
I subscribe to native magazines and native newspapers all over Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, down in the States. I subscribe to the, the biggest reserves in Navajo Nation. They put out a newspaper twice a month. When I get home, those papers will be waiting for me. Because I'm reading. I want to know, how are those native people doing over there? What's the good and the bad from those native people? What can I learn from those native people and bring it back home to help my native people out? And I do take pictures of the good and the bad. If I had a chance to show some pictures here, I'd show you some housing developments that are embarrassing, where there's garbage lying everywhere. So that first impression is very important. Strangers, when they come here, the first impression they're going to get is the visual impression when they drive around your subdivision here. And that visual impression when they drive past your school in your community buildings. So look after them. They don't have to be fancy, but just have that native pride of ownership. Because you do have a lot to be proud of here. You do. That's why they hold the elders gathering here all the time. Because what I've been told is you guys do it the best. You guys here do it the best. And to the young people, when you travel, you're representing your Métis people here. So dress the part. Don't walk around with your head down. Be proud, look proud, act proud. Because the other thing is native people, we all get painted with the same brush. We do. And I'll tell your mayor and council here, your ec dev department is one of the most important departments you have here. Your Ekadev department. Because when you come into a native village area, if you asked, okay, all the people that, that collect a paycheck, that work in social services, where you spend money, that's not where you make money, you spend money in education and health, administration, and you'd fill up a few tables. But then put over here the people responsible for making the money. Who in this community is responsible for making the money to make sure this community has financial strength? It's usually the EcDev department, the development corporation. But what happens in most First Nations is you have so many people on the social service side spending money and very few people on the EcDev side making money. There's a big imbalance amongst our people. You come to Osuyus, the most, the most employees sit on the business side of the scale. Most of our employees and most of our money generation is on the business side of the scale. Because we're an independent community. It's got to be your business sector that is the biggest employer. And the other thing that I've noticed from my own personal experience, when Osuyus was poor, Nobody paid attention to us. All those white people would say, all oh, those poor Indians, they should get a job, those poor Indians. That's the federal government's responsibility. It's not our, that, those poor Indians. Nobody ever knocked on our doors. But once we started making money and having businesses, and the non-native people saw that we were an economic power, this is what happened. White people and white companies, they now knock at our doors constantly because we're not poor anymore. Non-native people in business and government will pay attention to you when you're financially strong. That's why I love it when I see native people getting involved in business. I love seeing that. I love seeing native people competing with those non-native people in their region. Competing with them. Because I know damn well, given the chance and given the opportunity, 
as native people, we can all work anybody. We can work just as hard as anybody else. We can be just as productive as anybody else. We're just as good workers because we're the original peoples of this land. We survived here for 10,000 years through hard work. That's how the old timers all survived. They worked hard. So keep working hard and getting back to that working culture and concentrate on making money. Again, it's not a love of money. Money equals opportunity. That's what money means. Here's my best economic development story I'll leave with you. This is the best. This, this is why I love being in business. This is why I love making money for the City Singing Band. This is why I love creating jobs. If you ever come to Osuyus, we live right next to a small town of 5,000 people. It's not very big. That's where I went to school. Now we have a school on the res that goes up to grade six. But still half of our people go to the white school in Oliver, they go to the public school. A few years ago, one of the white teachers said to me, she said, Clarence, all the res kids, all the native kids are bragging. I'm talking about little kids this high. Since the native kids are bragging to the white kids, to the Asian kids, to the East Indians, to all the, to all the white kids. I said, what are they bragging about? I'm talking about little grade school kids. They're bragging that the best playgrounds are on the res. <laughs> Again, we put our money where our mouth is. I can't talk about believing in youth programs if I don't have the money to back up my words. So we constantly put money into youth programs. We constantly put money into our, our kids' playground. This is what I want for your community, just like at Osuyus. I want our kids when they're this high to be bragging about what they got. I want our kids when they're this high to be bragging about what their community has to those non-native people out there. I don't want them to be ashamed of it. I don't want them to be walking around with their heads down. That is so cool when I see native kids this high bragging about what their community has. That's what I want to see happen here. That's what I want to see happen all across Aboriginal country. Is our youth start bragging about what they got and not being ashamed of it. That's why I love being on the business side of the scale. Because when it comes down to it, it's a business side of the scale. It's the economic horse that's going to look after everything. It's going to pull that social cart. You can't put the cart before the horse. A famous saying is, the best social program's a job. I firmly believe that. The best social program is a job. And the, one of the things I love hearing from my people, and I've heard this over and over again, even when one of my people has lost one of their loved ones, or something bad has happened in their family's life. I've had people sitting across my desk with tears in their eyes saying, you know the only thing keeping me going at this time is my job. The only thing that's getting me through this difficult time in my life is my job. I love my job. That's what I want Native people to be saying. Those are, those are that's music to my ears when a native person says, I love my job. You got people in this community that love their job because they care about this community. And Vince talked about scolding a little bit. This is what I've learned about people that scold you. And if your community wasn't doing, if I saw garbage line everywhere, or you shamed me as a native person, I'd be standing up here scolding a little bit. Because the other thing, as I mentioned, we get painted with the same brush. If you have a native gas station in store, for example, and a stranger goes there, white people go there, and they get treated badly, guess what they're gonna think? They're gonna think all native gas stations in store treat people badly. I was in Ontario last week, they opened up a hotel, three. Three native reserves got together, bought a piece of land, 
off the reserve, opened up a hotel. I told them, you now belong to the families of First Nations that own a hotel. Do it right. Because if you get into business and you don't do it right, you're going to embarrass the rest of us. Because if Native people stay at your hotel, I mean, non-Native people stay at your hotel and get treated badly, they're going to think all Native hotels treat people badly. So when you have a Native business, you're not just re representing yourselves. You're re representing all Native people across the country. Because the white people that go there are going to think this is how all Native businesses are run. So I hope your community gets involved in business. I hope they do. But if you're going to do it, do it right. Do it with hard work. Do it with Métis pride. Do it with that Métis hard work ethic from 100 years ago. And do it right. Because if you don't, you're going to embarrass the rest of us. Because whether it's Métis or First Nation, we're all looked at as Native people. And when they talk about royalty, Floyd Westerman, I don't know if you've watched Dances with Wolves, Floyd Westerman was on there. He was Ken Bears, the old chief. He passed away a couple of years ago. I had a chance to listen to him when I was in university, when I was 20 years old. And I still got his tapes. I listened to his tapes in my vehicle. This is what he said. He said, Royalty does not exist. White people's royalty exists in England. Their kings and their queens are in France. That's where the white people's royalty is. When you're on your traditional lands, you're, the royalty of this land does not come from England or France. When you're on your traditional lands, these lands here, you are the royalty of this land. In this area, you people in this room, you, this is your territory. You are the royalty of this land. It's not the queen. It's not some king from overseas. So he said, act like royalty. Don't take a back seat to anybody in your traditional territory as native people. Back home, we fight with those mining companies. We fight with the forestry companies. We, we make sure we're in those rooms getting the best deal we can get for our people. Because we're the royalty of that land and we expect royalty payments. So that's royalty payments coming back to our First Nation. Because we're the royalty of, we tell those white corporations, we're the royalty of this land. You're going to owe us some money when you develop, when you do business in our traditional backyard. So do it right. And I wish you the best of success. I hope some of you have a chance to come to Osuyus. We had a youth group from Ontario fly a group of youth to, to Osuyus. They walked around our operations. I firmly believe we're a visual people. We have to see it. Sometimes we have to see it to get it. And I want young people all of our Aboriginal people in this country see nice things when they, when they grow up. Because sometimes all you need to see is something once and it'll stay with you the rest of your life. Sometimes all you need to hear is one sentence or one word and it'll stay with you the rest of your life. A lot of things have stayed with me. But I still need a kick in the rear once in a while. And that's why we have to scold one another sometimes. So when you, when you see something not done right, or somebody not doing it right, you know who the people are that scold you? What I've learned, the people that scold me back home when I'm not, not doing something right, they're the ones that care about you. The ones that care about you are the ones that are gonna scold you the most. Because the ones that don't care about you, they ain't gonna say nothing. They're just going to let your yard stay messy. They're just going to let you look messy. They're just going to let you be lazy. But those that scold you, as a Mohawk elder once told me, in the native way, 
That's the traditional way to learn, is sometimes we have to scold one another. So the ones, whether it's your parents, your aunts, your uncles, whether it's the mayor and council, or some of your leadership here, when something's not going right, we gotta scold once in a while, but we do it in a nice way, in order to lift people up, not to keep them down. In the Indian way of scolding, you don't do it to hurt somebody and hope they stay hurt. You scold people or you bring up bad stuff because you want to get rid of that bad behavior. You want to get rid of that stuff. And you want things. You want that person to be better and lead a better life. So to the elders, the mayor and council, the leadership, elected and non-elected leaders from here, I wish you all the business success in the world. And it's not easy. It's not gonna be easy because just, just like being healthy, the best athletes always train the hardest, always work out the hardest. I had a chance to see your track. Wow, that's an awesome track. And the best exercise in the world is running. That's the best. We have a first class gym back home. When I get back home, that's where I love going to our weight room. We have a first class gym. A lot of white kids come to our gym and our fitness facilities. And we did that with our own source, own source revenue. Again, you have to look after the mental side and the physical side and the spiritual side and the emotional side. You have to look after all the quadrants. But to me, the pillar one of the pillars is, of course, our heritage and culture. But the other pillar is that economic pillar, the business pillar. And I hope you look after the settlement you received. Don't squander it. Don't waste it. Turn it into an investment. When we talk seventh generational thinking, you have to put it into action with the money you've got. <coughs> You do have to think seven generations ahead. And I know just like back home, our people, especially our young people, need jobs. Real jobs. Real jobs that give them a sense of identity. This is the other thing that I've learned off the reserve. And I even do it. You even do it. After you meet somebody, after you exchange names, as native people, we're always wanting, what's your tribal affiliation? What tribe or nation do you come from? After you get through those introductions, what's the next question? What's the next question that's always asked between strangers? It's always, what do you do for work? What's your job? What do you do for work? How do you support yourself? That question is always at the top of the list. What's your job? If you're a young person, I hope your job's high school, grade school, college, university. But after that, you have to be able to answer that question. What's your job? Too many Native people put their head down when they're asked that question. Where are you working? What's your job? I don't want my people back home putting their head down when strangers ask them, what do you do for work? What do you do to help raise, what do you do to raise your kids? As a, as a man, what do you do? I don't want my people putting their head down when they're asked that important question. What do you do for a living, what's your job? I want my people to say, I love my job. I love working in construction. I love work. We have people back home that love working in mines. I have one of my best friends. He loves working in underground mines. That's what he loves to do. I love driving truck. I love working in the mine. I love working in the office. I love being a school teacher. I love working in administration. And the people I've met, a few people I've met from your community, I can tell they love their people here. They love it, they love and they care about this place here. And they want the very best for it. 
So with that, thank you for having me here. All of those that brought me here. I hope someday some of you will be able to come to Osuyus. I want to see intertribal commerce come back amongst our peoples before the white people separated us. We had trade routes. We were business people before. That's why archaeological evidence proves what's found up in the north is found deep in the south. What's on west coast is wound up on the east coast before the white people ever got here. Because we had trade routes, we had commerce amongst our people. We supported each other in business. So with that, Vince, I was glad to talk to you on the phone. You kind of talk like I do. When I first talked to you, I thought this guy talks like my mom or my grandma. And that's probably how I talk too. I talk like the older people. You know, we need, we need to get off our butt. We need to quit pointing the finger. When I first became chief, I did a lot of this. I pointed the finger out there a lot. I pointed the finger to all the white people, this white people, that. Nowadays, I point the finger within. Because our biggest challenges and our biggest obstacles are within our own circles. That's where our biggest challenges and our biggest obstacles are going to be amongst our own people and how we treat each other. But also, that's where our biggest opportunity lies too. That, that's how this stuff works. The biggest opportunity is going to be the mayor and council, the elected leadership, the other leaders in this community and how they work together. And if they can get rid of this crab syndrome, this crab syndrome that exists, even in Osuyus is still there. So again, I wish you all the best of success. Native pride every day, everywhere you go. Métis pride, keep it going. Lim Lim. Hold on, guys. Give me uh, two minutes. Give me two minutes. Um, we don't have much. As you can see here, we try and make gifts. We have a lot of guests this week, so we made paddles. Something that's in our backyard, as he says. We had two left this morning. We went to check. One was a picture of a deer with antlers, and one is a soaring eagle. What do you think I chose? This could be you. When you walk out of here, you say, that's going to be me. So. With humility from Mike and all of us, we give this to you, a simplest of gifts, but it's crafted by our hands and our hearts. And you are our keynote for this week because with humility, we see you as this. We see your community as that, and that's where we want to go. We have a bus to ride, and let's enjoy that bus to prosperity and independence. Thank you guys, probably lunch in two places, traditional food over here and cheeseburger food over here, enjoy. Seaweed band tonight.